Let's uh, bow our heads and pray as we have the privilege of opening up the Word of God. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Jesus, for your mercy and your love and your goodness and kindness and the privilege we have now to open your precious Word. Lord, we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to teach us your Word, God. We pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction from your word. To lead us and guide us into your righteousness. To help us, Lord, to love you with all our heart, and soul, and mind, and strength. And to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Precious Father, right now, Lord... I pray that you will anoint my lips from all high. Not my words, for they are nothing. But your words are healing. And they are life. And they are what we need at this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, my mom works in a hospital. And so when she gets ready for surgery, she has to dress like this. Put the rubber gloves on and the mask and the head gear, the head covering. They go into surgery. She is the one who hands the tools to the doctor. So before they go into surgery, they have to get have to be sterilized. The tools have to be sterilized. And then they have to cover themselves like this. Same way with the SWAT team. Whenever they go into a riot or wherever they may be going into, they have to dress in certain ways to protect themselves. The chest covering, the helmet, the mask, the, the gloves, everything. They have to wear the right armor for the right situation to what they're going into. Joey and I, and we, we, you know, we do Taekwondo, and so when we spar each other or whoever we're sparring, we wear gear, we wear a head covering. A helmet. We wear hand mitts. We wear foot covering. So none of us get hurt. And so we can. So we're going into the to the sparring protected. Well, brothers and sisters, let me show you something here. Whether you know it or not, think about it or not, we are in a war. We're in a war. In a spiritual battle. Listen to these words from Revelation 12 verses 7 through 9. It says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. But he, the devil, was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was cast out or hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to this earth and his angels were cast out with him. So here we are. We are in a spiritual battle between God and Satan and it's over us. It has moved from heaven and now on earth when the devil and his angels were cast out with him. And so we are at war, brothers and sisters. We are in a war. And we need to have the right armor on to have victory in this war. Look at what Paul says. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Paul, we have been talking about in the book of Ephesians, that it's, it's about Jesus and accepting Him and how He's bringing the church together as one, Gentiles and Jews. And so now he finishes up in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, and he says, Finally, out of all the things that I have talked about, and how glorious it is that Jesus has brought salvation, and he's made the two one. He says, finally, finally, here's how he ends it. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength or the power of his might. You hear
hear what he's saying? He's saying be strong in who? In the Lord. In this warfare that we have, brothers and sisters, Paul wants us to know whom our strength comes from. Because, brothers and sisters, we cannot win this war in our own strength. We are powerless. We are powerless. We are powerless against the devil. Do you hear me? Okay, just making sure. All right? We are powerless. And Paul says, hey, 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 you need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This is where victory comes from in Jesus. We only win when we are strong in the Lord. That's it. That's why Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength or power of his mind. And then he says, and then he says, put on the full. You notice what he says here? Put on the full armor of God. So that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. You see, brothers and sisters, we can't put on just half of the armor and think we're okay. Right? You can't just put on half of it. You've got to put on the full or the whole armor. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able, or in other words, as the Greek says, so that you will have power to stand firm against the schemes or the methods or the wiles or the plans of the devil. You need to put on the full armor, not half of it, not a fourth of it, not a little bit of it, or not what you want to put on and don't put on. You need to put on every single part of it. So that you will be able or that you will have power to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And brothers and sisters, let me just tell you this. Peter brings it up so beautifully when he says, look, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says, you need to be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, your enemy, the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And the only way that you're going to be able to stand against the schemes, against this lion, is if when you put on the full armor of God. That's it. That's the only way. I like how James brings it up. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. When you put on the full armor of God, brothers and sisters, you are going to be able to resist the devil. And, 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 and think about this. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. The only way you're strong is by putting on the full armor of God. That's it. That's it. He goes on and he says, listen, listen to this. For our struggle, our struggle, is not against, and Paul's making this clear. He says, look, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against Gentile and Jew. Our struggle is not against each other here in this church. But against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Brothers and sisters, let me make this clear. We are not each other's enemies. Do you hear it? Our struggle, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against each other. Some people want to make it that way, don't they? Some people want to make it that way. <laughs> I, I, I remember one of my uh, pastor friends was telling me 
that his church was divided right down the middle. Okay? Depending on which side of the church you sat on is whose side you, you would take. What their battle was was against whether we use plastic silverware or real silverware. And depending on which side of the church you sat on, that's whether you wanted to use real silverware or plastic. And let me tell you this, it was so divisive that when visitors came in, if they sat on this side of the church, the ones over here would not talk to them. If they sat on this side of the church, the ones over here would not talk to them. I just told him, I said, well, bring both and you'll make both of them happy. And then they can use whatever they want to use. Mm -hmm. Problem solved. But you see, brothers and sisters, what, he, he, here's the thing. With that in mind, you know who was actually behind that? The devil was because he wants to come in and tear up churches. Yeah. And our battle is not against each other. It's against the devil and his angels who wants to, who, who walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to tear us up. Why? Because he knows he has a short time. He knows he has a short time. He knows he's done for and he wants to make us done for. But, brothers and sisters, when we put on the full armor of God, we will have power to stand against the schemes, the methods, the plans of the devil. That's it. Remember, our battle is not against each other. It's against the devil and his angels. And brothers and sisters, remember this. Put this in your mind. Think about it all the time. When you are with Jesus, you are a winner. You're on the winning team. The devil is a loser. He's already lost. And continue to remind him of that fact. Therefore, because our struggle is not against flesh and blood, because our battle is against the devil, he says, therefore, because of what I just said, therefore, because we're in a war, because we're, we're against the devil and his angels, therefore, take up, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist the devil and he will flee from you. And having done everything to stand firm. Brothers and sisters, we are in a spiritual battle, not against each other. We need to be here for each other. We need to pray for one another. We need to lift each other up because every one of us are in the same battle against the devil and his angels. We need each other more now than ever because I believe, I believe that the coming of Jesus is right around the corner. I believe that a time of trouble is coming upon us like we've never seen before. And we need each other now more than ever. We need each other. We need each other. So Paul says, take up the full armor of God. Take it up. Take it up. Put it on. Put it on. You know, Paul is writing this letter from a Roman jail. And every day he saw a Roman soldier come and guard him. He noticed how the soldier was dressed in armor. They all had it in common. Day in and day out, when they came to Paul in jail, they all had an armor on. You see, the armor was a symbol of loyalty to the emperor. It represented the soldier's readiness to do the emperor's bidding. You see, the apostle, as he looked at it, he goes, there's a lesson here. There's a lesson for Christians with this armor as soldiers. You see, when a Christian puts the armor on, it means we are loyal to God. We're loyal to His call. We're loyal and ready to do his service. And so what Paul does is he draws the analogy 
and applies it to the warfare that we are in now. That we need to take up this full armor of God, showing that we are loyal to one commander in chief, Jesus Christ. And we are here to do His bidding today in 2018. And so now Paul, draw, Paul draws the analogy of this warfare, this armor that we need to put on. He says in Ephesians 6.14, the first thing is, is stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Stand firm. We just sung the song of BBS. Stand firm. This belt of truth is the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, we need to stand upon this Word. For this is the foundation that will never fail. This is truth that we need for our lives. We need to put it on. Put it around our waist. I love the song that we sing that's in the hymnal when it's standing on the promises of Christ my King. Standing on the promises that can never fail. It is a foundation that is firm that we need to put around our waist. You see, Jesus says that the truth will do what? Set you free. We were talking in Sabbath school today, me and Emsley and his dad, we were saying, did you ever notice when a person lies, what happens? They crumble, don't they? Don't they? And when you tell one lie, you have to think of other lies to cover up for that lie. Right? And you can begin to tell when a person lies because you're like, wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. Their whole life crumbles. The foundation is shaky and it goes away. But brothers and sisters, when you have the truth, it is a foundation that you can stand on. It is a foundation that will protect you. You don't have to think of anything else. You, you just, if you tell the truth, you just tell the truth and it continues to come out. Brothers and sisters, this is the truth that we need to put around our waist. This is the truth that we need to stand firm in from Genesis to Revelation. Putting on this belt of truth means that we are totally committed to Jesus. What He says, we will do. Where He commands, we will go. What He says, we will obey. We will live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Let me, let me tell you some truths that you can stand on, that you need to tie around your waist, especially for this war that we are in. Listen to this. If, if you have a pen and a piece of paper or in the bulletin info, I want you to write down these verses, okay? The book, the chapter, and the verse. You don't have to write the rest of it out. But write it down, go home, and memorize it. Listen, these are the truths that you can stand on, especially for the warfare that we are in right now. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, God says, For I know the plans that I have for you, plans to give you a future and a hope. There's hope in Jesus in these last days. Jeremiah 29, 11 is what it was. Listen to this, Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Listen, he ends the verse by saying, Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Brothers and sisters, in these last days in this warfare, we need to take refuge. So Jeremiah 29, 11, Psalm 34, verse 8. Psalm 34, verse 8. This next one, Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40. And you, and you can, and you can abbreviate these books. Okay, Isaiah is I-S period. All right? All right, so Isaiah 40. You can't abbreviate 40, it's 4 0. Isaiah 40, 29, and 31. Listen to this. Listen to this. We are in a warfare, the belt of truth, and we can stand firm on this. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Listen, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. 
Isaiah 40, 29, and 31. All right. Listen to this. Romans 8, 28. R-O-M period. 8, 28. <coughs> Listen. We're in a warfare. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Romans 8. R-O-M period again. 8, 38, and 39. Listen. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Look, Romans 8, 38, 39. Okay, Lamentations. And when you think of Lamentations, you think, what's in there? But there is something. Lamentations, L-A-M period. 3, 22 and, and 23. Listen. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 1 Corinthians, the number one, C-O-R period. 1 Corinthians 10 13. He will not let us be tempted beyond what we are able to bear, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape. And then the greatest one, and you can look this up, I don't have a book in chapter and verse. I will never leave you nor forsake. Now you see that, brothers and sisters, this is the truth that we need to have around our waist. To, if you want to be victorious in this spiritual battle, put on the belt of truth and stand firm. You see, a soldier not wearing a belt meant that he was off duty. Let me tell you, ask you this, is there a time in the Christian life when we can consider ourselves off duty? No. We can never be off duty. The moment we think we're off duty, we're in trouble. Stand therefore, Ephesians 6.14. Having girded your loins about with the belt of truth. Next, the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate covered the torso from the neck to the hip. Protecting the vital organs of the body. Hence, it is important for us to protect our mind, our emotions, our vital organs of spiritual life with the breastplate of righteousness. And telling us to put on this breastplate, the Apostle Paul exhorting us to put on Christ and His righteousness. Christ, our righteousness, is our eternal protection. To put this breastplate on means that we get rid of our self-centeredness, our self-righteous, our sinful ways, and put on the righteousness that is Jesus. You see, our righteousness does not come from our good works. Our righteousness only comes from Jesus. It is His righteousness that we need to put on. That's it. That's it. Like in the beautiful picture of Zechariah 3, 3 and 4. Write that down and read this story when you get home. Zechariah chapter 3, that's a Z-E-C-H period, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. I'm giving you the abbreviation so you can hurry up and be like, what did he say? Z-E-C-H period, you don't remember that. So Joshua was standing there. He's got filthy garments on which really, in other words, represents self-centeredness, self-righteousness, his sinful ways, and Jesus, and the angel says, take that away from him and put on these white robes, which represents the Christ righteousness. If we want to be protected in this spiritual warfare, put on the belt of truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's the only way, brothers and sisters, that we are protected. It's not us. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Next, put on the good news of peace. The shoes, the gospel of peace. Shoes of the gospel of peace. It's interesting that Roman soldiers wore boots with studded nails on them to ensure good traction during battle. A soldier cannot afford to slide or fall when locked in deadly combat. Likewise, Christians need to stand firm and unshakable in the gospel of peace to ensure victory. It's interesting. Why is the gospel likened to shoes? Listen to this verse in Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Who proclaim what? Peace. 
who bring good tidings, who proclaim, who says to Zion, your God reigns. If we want victory over the devil, all his angels, not only are we to put on the belt of truth, not only are we to put on the breastplate of righteousness, but if we want victory, we are to take, walk, and be active in carrying the good news to everyone. You hear me? We are to be active in carrying the gospel to everyone. An inactive Christian cannot be a victor in spiritual warfare. We're to let everyone know that peace can only be found in Jesus. The peace that we have found in Jesus, we are to share with others. Johannes Blau, he says this. He says, missionary work is like sandals that have been given to the church in order that it shall set out on the road and keep on going to make known the mystery of the gospel. You see, when the Samaritan woman met Jesus and she found peace, she went to her villagers and shared it with her. When the, the invalid at the pool of Bethesda found peace and healing in Jesus, he did not hesitate to bear witness. You see, when we found peace, we found healing, we found hope in Jesus, we need to tell it to everyone. That's what we're all about. We're missionaries. Putting on the gospel shoes and taking it to everyone. Now, we may have different ways of taking it. You know, not everybody is an evangelist, not everybody is a pastor, but everybody is a witness. God has done something for you that someone else needs to hear. You see, it says the Bible says in Revelation that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Everyone has a testimony. Everyone. Whether you've grown up Adventist or Christian all your life or not, you have a testimony. Jesus has saved you. Paul says, hey, put on the full armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace. But that's not all. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil. Listen, take up the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith. <coughs> with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. What's interesting is that the Roman soldiers, what they would do with their shield, because people would shoot uh, flaming arrows at them, uh, arrows on fire, right? And what they would do is they would wet down their shield so when the flaming arrows touched their shield, it would be extinguished. Take up the shield of faith. The Bible says in Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38, that the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please Him, that's God, for he that comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently Faith that God exists. Faith that God rewards. Faith that God keeps His word. That we trust in a God who never sleeps nor slumbers. We have faith in a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I like to call this faith what I read in the Bible. I like to call it, I put it on Facebook before, that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is too hard for Him. And as I was reading that verse the other day for devotions, nothing is impossible, nothing is too hard for Him. Do I believe it? Do I believe it? Do I believe that nothing is impossible with Him? That what He says, He will do. You know, Jesus said, and I was reading this morning for devotions in Matthew 6, 25. He says, why are you worrying? Why do you worry? He said to 1 Peter, cast all your cares upon me. Let me do the worrying. 
For you see, Jeff, you, you can't make your bank account bigger. God says just sometimes, as I said before, He says, you know what? You know, it may look like there's too much month at the end of the month. I'm sure all of us have had that, right? You're like, oh man, there's seven days. There's, there's like three weeks left before I get paid, and I got seven dollars. What am I gonna do? God says, let me take care of it. You don't worry. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is too hard for Him. He says, you just test me and see. Prove me if, I, if I'm not the God who I say I am. Do you believe that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you? Do you believe that He will supply all your needs? Do you believe that He's coming again? Do you believe that He can shut the mouth of lion? That you can walk through fire? That He will open up the windows of heaven? You see, this is what the faith, this is the faith that we need. That we need to put on. It is faith that protects us from the fiery darts of the devil. And they come in different forms. They come in temptation. They come in doubt. They come in lust. They come with despair. They come with rebellion. They come with guilt. Whatever the dart, whatever the missile, the shield of faith is strong enough to repel it. That's why it says in Proverbs 30 verse 5, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. It's about faith. The just shall live by faith. I mean, I've been down before where I'm like, all right, Lord, you need to move right now. In his time. He's got it. He'll take care of it. Leave it in his hands. Nothing is impossible with him. Nothing is too hard for our God. Nothing. Nothing. So we need to continue. Because that's not all. We have to protect our head. Ephesians 6, 17, take up the helmet of salvation. The helmet is a life-protecting device. It protects the head from danger. You're watching an NFL game. They have a helmet on. Motorcycle riders have a helmet on. They're supposed to. They should. To protect the head. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, that the helmet is the hope of salvation. Salvation. So many people want to make salvation hard. Don't they? They want to make salvation hard. And when we make salvation hard, people get worried about whether they're saved or not. And they worry, and they worry, and they worry about their salvation. Am I saved? Pastor, am I saved? Do I have on the helmet of salvation? Am I saved? We want to make it so hard. Now look at what Jesus says. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord to put on the helmet of salvation, that person will be saved. You call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. You know, Jesus answers a two-word prayer. You can make it as simple as this. Two words that you can pray and you will be saved. Father, save me. And He will save you. Save me. And he will save you. Help me. And he will help you. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost from the guttermost those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. You call upon the Lord, you will be saved. He is able to save to the uttermost. Those who come to God through Him. He saves you. He wants to save you. No matter what you have done in your life. No matter where you are in your life. God wants you to put on the helmet of salvation and be saved. That's why we have in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. He loved everyone here at the Raleigh Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
that when we call upon Him and believe in Him, we will have eternal life. You just say, Lord, save me, and He will put on the helmet of salvation. You'll put it on. The hymn says, we have heard a joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. That's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus saves. We have salvation. Jesus wants us to experience salvation today. The helmet of salvation is one of our defenses against the enemy of our soul. Keep telling the devil when he comes with doubt, when he comes with temptation, I am saved by the blood of the Lamb. I have on the helmet of salvation, and I am a son and daughter of Him. That's it. That's what it's all about. That's it. What's interesting is with these weapons is that they are defensive in nature. They are weapons of protection against Satan's onslaught. And now we come to a weapon that is offensive in nature. The sword of the Spirit. Which is the Word of God. It is offensive in nature. You see, notice it says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which means that this Bible here, this sword that we have, is not a human document. It comes from God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Every word is true. Every word is powerful. Listen to how powerful it is. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says, For the Word of God is what? Living and Active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It is so powerful. Listen, it is so powerful that Jesus used it to defeat the devil in Matthew chapter 4. Remember that story? Jesus had been eaten for 40 days. Remember, and the devil comes to him and tempts him and says, If you are the Son of God, let these stones become bread. And Jesus said, It is what? Written. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Three times Jesus says, It is written. It is written. It is written. And, and the devil was defeated. Brothers and sisters, if we want the Word of God to be our offense, David gives us instructions on how to do that. Psalm 119, verse 11. We need to hide God's Word in our heart. Okay? If we want the Word to be our offense, we need to hide it in our hearts. Which means we need to pick this book up and read it. Let me tell you something else you can do. You can memorize it. A lot of people say, oh, I can't memorize it. My mind is too old to memorize. Or I'm too young to memorize. <laughs> memorize the Bible. You're never too young and never too old to memorize God's Word. Memorize it. Memorize the Bible. If Jesus used it to defeat the devil, we can use it to defeat the devil as well. It is part of the armor. The belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. The helmet of salvation. The shoes of the gospel of peace. The sword of the spirit. And he ends by this. Even though this is not part of the armor. This is how Paul ends. Pray in the spirit at all times. And on every occasion. Stay alert. And be persistent in your prayers for all believers. Everywhere. The importance of prayer cannot be overemphasized. Especially in the day and time that we are living in, prayer is important. You hear me? You hear what I'm saying? The days and times that we are living in, prayer is important. 
We need to be on our knees praying. That's why it says in 1 Timothy 2, 1, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. And give thanks for them. Pray for each other. Remember, we pray until something happens. We pray without ceasing. James says in chapter 5, verse 16, the fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman accomplishes much. And brothers and sisters, we need to be on our knees praying for each other. We're all in this battle together. The battle is not against us. The battle is against the devil and his angels. And we need to pray for each other. Pray for each other. Even the ones you don't like very much, pray for them. Pray for them. Jesus had enemies, didn't he? He had enemies. And what did he do on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He prayed for his enemies. And you need to pray for yours as well. That they will be saved. Pray for everyone. Jesus prayed often. And we need to pray often. We are not safe one minute without prayer. And how do you pray? You talk to God as you would to a friend. You see, the only reason I am saved today... The only reason my wife is saved and the only reason my son and daughter are saved is because people in the church were praying for us. I remember telling them. I remember telling the church. This was the craziest thing I ever said to someone, a Christian. I remember telling them when they said, we're praying for you. I said, don't pray for me. Because I don't want to be saved. Well, thank goodness they did stop praying. <laughs> we are in a war. We are in a war. And we need the armor of God. We need all the armor. Not half, not a quarter. Not choosing what we want to put on. If we're going to be victorious, if we're going to be victorious, we need to put on the full armor of God.
we thank you for the words today. Help us to put on the full armor. Truth, righteousness, gospel of peace, shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. The full armor, God, is what we need. For protection. For we are in a war, God. A spiritual battle. And each piece represents you. And in you, Lord, we have victory. In you, we are more than conquerors. And God, help us to pray without ceasing. For prayer changes things. Prayer brings strength. Prayer brings revival. And it's what we need at this time that we are living in, God. In your soon coming. Remind us day by day that our battle is not against each other, but it's against the devil. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.